culture, organizational culture, team culture is misunderstood, which is one reason why it is underappreciated for its power and ability to transform organizations for the better or the worse. Today, we're going to talk about what culture is and how to transform it for the better, better results, better communication, better retention. I mean, those are just to start of the list. Welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast, where we are helping leaders grow personally and professionally to lead more effectively and make a bigger difference for their teams, organizations, and the world. If you're listening to this podcast, uh, you could have been with us live, or you could be with us for future episodes live. To learn more about that so that you can get this valuable information sooner, and just go to our Facebook or LinkedIn groups and sign up there. You can do that by going to remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn to learn when we'll be having future live episodes because nearly every one of these episodes was once live with a studio or social media audience. Today's episode is brought to you by our new book, The Long Distance Team, Designing a Team for Everyone's Success. You can learn more about how to help your team be more effective in the future of work by going to longdistanceteambook.com. And with that, it's probably time to bring in our guest. Let me bring him on stage, so to speak. Here he is. Let me introduce him to you. Uh, his name is Matt Mayberry. He's an internationally acclaimed keynote speaker and global expert on leadership development, culture change, and organizational performance. His insights on leadership and business performance have been featured in Forbes, Fox News, Business Insider, Fortune, NBC, ESPN, and other major media outlets. He's here with us today in part because he's the author of a brand new book, Culture is the Way. You see it behind him if you're watching us. His clients include organizations like J.P. Morgan Chase, All Straight State Insurance, Philip 66, Mac Trucks, Fifth Third Bank, and the FBI. Uh, in his prior life, uh, Matt was a linebacker for the Indiana Hoosiers and the Chicago Bears. Uh, he took the lessons he learned on the field and in the locker room and took it straight to the boardroom. And I'm so glad that you're with us today, Matt. Welcome to the Remarkable Thanks so much for having me, Kevin. Look forward to it. Uh, you are not the first NFL linebacker who's been a guest on this show. Uh, we'll put a link in in the show notes, everybody, to the conversation I had with Gary Brackett, who was a linebacker for the Indianapolis Colts after being a linebacker for Rutgers, et cetera. Two Big Ten guys. There you go. Much uh, more. So, although Gary had a much more successful career than I, I'm sure. Yeah, we'll he dig did into win that. a Super Bowl. I uh, will just leave it I, at that, right? I like to joke uh, around so, that I was an almost NFL guy. Uh, you know, I'm sure we'll get into a little bit of that backstory there. But you know, Gary's. Uh, I don't know him personally, but great career. So we've got folks joining us from Long Island and St. Louis and Florida. And, you know, we worked uh, for a while, Matt, to make this happen. And it, it took us a while to get here. We've had a couple of fits and starts, but I'm so glad that you're here. And uh, so for those of you that are joining us live, continue to put in your comments, questions, tell us where you're from. We'd love to know that. But I want to start here, Matt, with you, and that is sort of, you do have this unique backstory of being a, a football player, and now you do the kind of work really that I do as well. Uh, what led you to doing this kind of work? You know, I, um, it was really unplanned. A lot of people, I think, when they you know, may look at it now, I even have a lot of close friends who thought that this was a whole scheme and planned out You know, that, hey, once my playing days were over with, that this is what I'd be doing. And really, it's the furthest thing from the truth. You know, long story short, Kevin, I... I got hurt back in 2010. So I got hurt in the preseason. Um, you know, I, so the preseason is a pivotal moment for a rookie, right? I mean, you know, you're on the brink of making the team. You start at fourth string linebacker, you move, you work your way up to second string uh, and all eyes are on you. You know, can you handle the pressure? Can you make it in the NFL? Uh, and I was having a great training camp, you know, and I, but I got injured. I suffered a, an ankle injury in the first preseason game playing the San Diego Chargers. And that was the end of my NFL career. So literally one game, my very first game in the NFL, my very first opportunity, one dream, one goal, it just completely ended like that in the blink of an eye, one in one game. And playing for your um, and, hometown and that, team, even. And playing for my hometown team, you know, and it was a big moment, bigger moment than you would realize, you know, just partly because, you know, I was a former, I'm sure we won't probably get into it here in this podcast, but, you know, overcame some trials and tribulations, uh, you know, growing up there uh, in the Chicago suburbs, you know, drug addict, uh, nearly lost my life on multiple occasions, almost threw my life away. My best sport was actually baseball, got kicked off the baseball team, 
Um, so I was a very bad, you know, teen, you know, getting in all kinds of trouble, really breaking my mother and father's heart. Um, so when I got injured in the NFL, that was much bigger than just like, hey, here's a guy who wanted to make it in the NFL, play in the NFL. It was this whole accumulation of just overcoming adversity from, you know, really when I was 13 years old all the way up to, you know, 16, 17 years old. Um, but in that moment, to answer your question specifically, Kevin, uh, I was depressed. You know, I was massively depressed. I'm sure, you know, you've probably seen in the news that what happens when an athletic career is over with, you know, you go into depression, the suicide rate is up at an all-time high, uh, and you lose your identity because for so long, so much of your life, that sport is your identity. Um, you know, but luckily I got asked to speak at a leadership event. So even though I have a walking boot on and I really can't walk, I, I tear a bone off of my ankle, my football NFL career is over with. And at this point, I didn't know what was going to, you know, take shape for my life. I had no idea what was in store. But I met a man by the name of Stedman Graham a month before I got injured. And he asked me to speak at this leadership event when he found out that I got injured. And I ended up speaking at that event, you know, getting a D in public speaking in college and being terrified to speak in front of a group of 10 people. I had no idea what I was doing, but, you know, I figured, hey, nothing else is going on in my life. So let me take this opportunity uh, and that was really the, the rest of my, you know, the start of my journey. That was the beginning of birthing a new career, uh, speaking at that one event, and then word of mouth got her out from there. Well, that's, that's really awesome. And now we're here in part, largely we're here because of your new book, Culture is the Way. And so that's really where I want to focus our time today. Um, yep. So let's start with the question that I sort of teased in the open uh, about okay. What is culture anyway? What people, different people have different definitions. I have a definition. I'm curious. Well, I know because I've read the book, but what's your definition of culture? What is it from your perspective? You know, it's an, and it's a very fantastic and important question, Kevin. I think one of the things I do in the book is really try to drive clarity around what is culture and why is it so important? Because, you know, really for the past 12 years, uh, I've seen a huge misconception of what culture is, what it's intended to do in an organizational setting. Uh, and also the importance of it. You know, it's not just fluff and, you know, kind of what people want to hear. I mean, it is the one biggest competitive advantage that really every leader has at their disposal. And I define culture as behavior at scale. And I think the athlete in me, you know, playing in college, playing throughout, uh, getting that even that front row opportunity in the NFL, the very short time I was there, seeing what the best organizations, the best teams do, how they're structured, the clear expectations. And really, ultimately, it's, it's not what we say. It's not we pro what we proclaim our culture to be. It's how we behave when the CEO or the head coach is not around, you know, and it's behavior at scale. And it's the, it's the, it's the easiest and most simple way I can define culture uh, because you see a lot of organizations and you probably see this, you know, traveling all throughout the country in your work. Uh, a lot of leaders will think that, hey, we have our cute core values here. We're going to post them throughout the headquarters. Th this is our culture. And we even got this huge page dedicated on our website about what our culture is and, and how important it is. But at the end of the day, when you start to walk into an organization and spend 30 days, you know, with their leaders and the rest of the, the, the employees, especially when the leaders aren't present in the, that moment, you'll start to see very clearly of what that culture is. So why is it, I mean, we've never talked about it more than we do now, right? Uh, I've had a number of guests on over time talking about culture. Uh, our new book has a big component that's about culture. So if so many people are writing about it and talking about it and apparently worried about it, why is it so misunderstood? I mean, I, I think we could spend two hours here just talking about why it's misunderstood. You know, I, I think number one, it's misunderstood. And really part of the reason why I think leaders don't fully immerse themselves in it uh, and haven't really for the past you know, let's say 10, 15, 20 years, you're starting to see this shift, like you said right now, accelerating that change a little bit. Uh, but I think the number one reason is, you know, short term, you know, the instant gratification that we all cling to, you know, we cling to instant gratification. We want to, you know, hey, change our operational procedures. We want to drive our sales, you know, effectiveness in the marketplace. We want to do this and digital transformations going on here and a million things are running around. And in a lot of those things, you can create change you know, within a month, within a couple of weeks, maybe not fully, but you, you're, you know, you couldn't create a good, good amount of change within the first couple of weeks. Now, changing a culture, though, and building cultural excellence, that's a long term endeavor. You know, there's a start date, and there is no end date. You know, I think one of the reasons why a lot of leaders get sidetracked, and they get paralyzed in their effort to build and improve their workplace culture, 
is because it is a constant ongoing thing. And I think that, you know, at the end of the day, when the pace of business picks up and other things in your life are accelerating, and then you add in personal complications on top of that, uh, it's very easy to get sidetracked and kind of have the, the blinders up and deflectors of, you know, what's important and what's not. So uh, I, I put this on, on a lower third a little bit ago because I thought we might be heading there. But I, I do want to explore this because you do have this uh, experience uh, in football that uh, especially for sports fans is interesting. Uh, but I, I think as it relates to culture, that's that's where I'd like us to go. Like, what did you learn from the culture of sports or football that has implications or our lessons for all of us who aren't in that realm? So many, so many, you know, and and the easiest way I can describe it and kind of what it's done to my life and how it's benefited my career, both personally and professionally, uh, you know, is I I don't have my MBA, right? My parents don't have a business, Um, you know, prior to me starting my business, you know, 12 years ago, you know, I I had no really business experience. And really what I did, Kevin, was take everything I learned from the game of football with the greatest coaches that I've ever had, You know, how do they build team? How do they change behavior? How do they set the direction for their football program and really insert it in the business world? And the results were profound. And and over time, what I started to do was to draw the parallels that it doesn't matter really what sector we're talking about or even what sport we're talking about. You know, the best coaches, you know, truly have that DNA, that blueprint of what greatness consists of. And I think number one, you know, the biggest thing I learned is that, I mean, it is not only an ongoing and consistent a relentless effort to build culture. But number two, you know, they connect a deeper purpose to it. It's not just about winning games. It's about, hey, we want to build young men. You know, we want to build young men for the game of life. We want to build young men to not only get an opportunity to play at the next level, but we want to build great young men. That's going to make a difference in society. You know, and one of the reasons I went to Indiana, you know, we were joking offline here before we started because you're a Purdue guy. Um, You know, one of the reasons why I went to Indiana over Georgia and Tennessee and some of the big football scholarship offers I received is because my head coach at the time, Terry Hepner, he looked me directly in the eyes and said, you come to Indiana, you're going to get a great education. You're going to get an opportunity to play in the NFL. Yes. But more importantly, one day I can promise you looking me directly in the eyes and said, you will be more successful and make a bigger impact outside of the game of football than you ever will playing the game of football. And at that moment, Kevin, I didn't know the, you know, the magnitude of those words that he spoke to me, um, but it really changed my life forever. That football's, you know, what I did, it's not who I am. So that is one key lesson that I learned about building culture is that it's tying it to a deeper purpose. Um, you know, one of the other things I learned is that, uh, you know, really it, it has to be in every function of your company, right? It has to be every function of your program. I think one of the great things football coaches do is not only do they consistently communicate what the culture is, but they drive clear expectations of how that fits into your, you know, offense, defense, special teams, et cetera. And the best leaders in the business world do the same thing. You know, it's not just saying, hey, we want to build a great culture. It's tying culture to the day-to-day. It's tying culture and the behaviors that we want to mimic out in the marketplace Every single day, every team meeting, we're talking about what greatness looks like. We're talking about what not to do. So I think those are really some of the big lessons I learned from the game of football, you know, particularly as it relates to leaders driving and building culture, because it starts there. So uh, Jeremy, uh, who's who's uh, with us on LinkedIn, says, I often th- th- I think often leaders get focused on the enormous scale of changing culture instead of focusing on what the next step they can take right now to lead towards that future. Culture is much more than words painted on the wall. I think he's he's, he's sort of reinforcing and thumbs upping, uh, if you will, what what you, we've been talking about. And yes. and uh, so so I appreciate you sharing that, Jeremy. Uh, and and then he he goes on to say, building people for more than just the job they're being paid for. And and, and that now I, this is me now. Um, that's a cultural expectation, right? Uh, yes. Your coach, who you know uh, is probably one of the most beloved in Indiana. Um, football history yeah. um, saw that it was about something different and something bigger. And, and, right. and, and that is why he, you know, he, he uh, persuaded you to come join him as a Hoosier. So I think that that's right. a, that's a useful and valuable thing. So uh, in the book, you talk about, I think it's five things that yep. are components 
of a great culture and we don't have time to unpack them all because besides we want yep. everyone to make sure they get a copy we are talking with matt mary mayberry the author of the new book culture is the way here it is you see it behind him if you're watching us as well um and of course you can go get it you um so you talk about a variety of things uh keys to a great culture uh, but what are just a couple of them maybe that you feel led to share today yeah and so so those those five things um you know really what i you know the first question you asked me about what i learned from the game of football you know these five things are really it's an accumulation of kind of those five learning lessons of what i've seen of, of what does it take to build and consistently develop a great culture and then also for the past 12 years uh, getting a front row view and, you know, what are the best organizations in the business world do and what are those similarities? And that very first ingredient, you know, is that I think it's massively, massively overlooked. Um, and I, it, it's the importance of defining your culture. And the easiest way I can, you know, drive some clarity around what this really means is that let's say you have 20 employees that work at the same company and you ask those employees, what is your culture here? Nine out of 10 times, you're probably going to get 20 different responses. So what happens in the best football programs and also in the best organizations in the business world, if you ask those 20 employees, what is your culture here? What does it consist of? You know, how can you define your culture? They're probably going to give you a pretty similar answer as to what that culture looks like, what it is and why they work there, why they play there on that particular team. So that very first step is defining your culture. And I talk about the importance of a cultural purpose statement. And, and this cultural purpose statement is really a, you know, it could be a tagline, it could be a mantra, it could be you know, whatever that is to unite the organization into one defining mechanism, as far as this is our internal definition of why we why we're here, why we're a team, why we're an organization and what our culture consists of. Now, mind you, this is just the first step in the process, because I just said words alone don't build culture, hanging your core values on the website at your headquarters doesn't build culture. But it does hold an important place in the very beginning as far as defining your culture. One of the organizations I share in the book about their process of kind of changing culture and, and really building a healthy, high-performing culture, they picked a cultural purpose statement of get better today together. You know, GBTT. And this was all predicated on the fact of, you know, we have our behaviors, we have our values, what's important to us. We have our mission and all of that. But the internal forcing mechanism of, of what defines our culture is get better today together. That if we just get better today for this particular day, together as a team, we're eventually going to get to where we want to go. So really, their whole entire culture, everything is revolved around that cultural purpose statement. So I kind of take the readers through the process of how do you define that? Why is it important? Um, and, and really trying to draw a different lens on the importance of defining your culture. Uh, you know, the, the second step, like you said, we won't have enough time to dive into all five. But the second step kind of reverse engineers that process, right? So the cultural purpose statement is for a senior leadership team to define their culture. It's more of a top-down directive, right? There's no micromanaging involved. It's not the, you know, command and control type of leadership. But at the end of the day, leaders build culture. Leaders drive what their culture is and what, it, the, you know, how you define it. After you define your culture, it's all about reverse engineering into driving and connecting from a deeper level of engaging the hearts and minds of every single employee within your organization. And really this consists of, Kevin, I, I lay it out in the book with really a roadmap on how can senior leaders strategically engage all people managers within the company to reel them into that process so you're co-creating your culture together to drive more commitment, but also for those people managers to get with their direct reports and then you're having a cascade all throughout the organization about what's important to us. What do we need to change and improve on? Why do you work here? Are you fulfilled here? What makes this workplace very special and meaningful? Um, and then from there, right, it's turning the values into specific behaviors. I word it in the book as a behavioral manifesto, which is simply a one page document of taking your values and drawing very clear, distinct parallels into how do we behave in this organization, in this workplace. And why is that important? Um, so, so those are really the first two mechanisms of that five-step process to build a world-class culture. Uh, and then from there, it's taking everything out. And then it's an ongoing, like I've already kind of talked about and hit on, a uh, consistent process from there. So you said something. You, meant, you say it in the book. And you said it in a way just now. And I'm going to put it on the screen. Uh, and for those who aren't watching, here's what I'm putting up here. Top-down directed, bottom-up created. So I want you to say more yep. about that. But before you do, 
my observation is that oftentimes there are folks in organizations at, at levels anywhere below the C-suite that are saying, well, man, we ought to be changing that, but that doesn't belong to us. That That's somebody else's job. So talk to us about what you mean when you say, a little bit more about what you mean when you say top-down directed, but bottom-up created. Yeah, I think it's really so important. And I don't think it's just important for cultural change. I think it's important for really any kind of change or transformation within an organization. And I think that, again, drawing back to the comparison with football coaches, I think they're some of the best examples in, in the world. And even in the book, I, I kind of make the comparison. I'm not comparing being a business leader and being a college football coach, you know, of which job is harder. Um, but I am drawing the parallel of, you know, why I believe football coaches are some of the best cultural builders out there because everybody has talent. But one of the things I talk about uh, and also dive deep into the book as far as, you know, defining your culture, as I mentioned, it, it is top down. You know, the, the leaders of an organization have to define the culture. They have to define what it is. What is our behavior? Why is it important? And also, what is our identity from an internal perspective? Because every company has a mission statement, but that's more external focused you know, for the marketplace and for your customers, suppliers, et cetera. But how many companies and really spend enough time on the internal employee experience of what, what defines us internally? So that is top down. Bottom up then from there uh, is, you know, really all about driving the expectations. But it, then from there, it's, you know, I think Tom Peters mentioned the importance of management by wa wandering around, you know, of, of uh, you know, recognizing that you don't have all the answers and that's okay. The very best leaders I've ever been around, they do an exceptional job of, of defining the culture, driving clear expectations. But then from there, they're constantly asking, what can we change? What can we improve on? Are you happy? Do you have the, everything that you need to do your job to the best of your ability? And they're, they're letting the employees and they're letting their team members kind of create and be involved in that process. So it's co-created. And, and the power of co-creation is enormous. You know, I, I think I can write multiple chapters on the empower of really co-creation and what that could do from not only a culture perspective, but also for a morale perspective. So that top down, bottom of creative perspective is really the leader's got to define the culture from there. You know, after you drive those clear expectations of what that culture is, you then have to get out there. You have to get out in the market. You have to get out in the four walls of your organization and talk to people, you know, what's bugging them, what's eating them alive, what's keeping them up at night. And then also what are they yearning for from a deeper level? What are they yearning for uh, from their development perspective, both personally and professionally? And then finding a way to draw that gap, right? To shorten that gap of how can we put this in place for our workplace? So uh, there's, there's a whole, there's a big idea in the book that we don't have time to unpack. But the point is that even once you, once you've created this, behavioral picture, once you've created the, the ideal or what we would call the aspirational culture, there's still a lot more work to do, right? So, uh, and we could have a whole other conversation on that. But my question would be this, once we get past the first kinds of steps that we've talked about, what's the thing that most organizations forget or leave out after that? Oh, man. <laughs> You know, I, I, you got a couple hours. <laughs> um, if, if I had to pick one, you know, I think the biggest, the biggest gap, you know, as far as why most organizations may fall short in their efforts to build and cultivate a world-class culture of what world-class looks like for them in their organization, in their sector and industry, without a doubt, it would be leaders role modeling the culture that they want in the workplace. I, I think a lot of leaders don't understand the, the significance and importance, you know, they may, they may hear it like, yeah, you know, how I behave and, you know, it's way more important than what comes out of my mouth and what I communicate. But when you go through the day to day, and I, I use the reference of if you walk around with the leader for 30 days and you mimic, you know, watch what's coming out of their mouth, watch what they're communicating to the rest of the organization, but then you also tie, how are they behaving? How are they behaving behind closed doors? Are they truly mimicking and living and bringing to life their values and behaviors that they so pre and want their workplace? You know, and, and I think if you just focus on that, like an obsessive focus on every people manager and all leaders within the company, truly living and bringing to life the culture, that's when you start to change and cultivate, you know, cultural excellence from that alone. You know, I th I've seen so many organizations go through so much effort, so much time, so much energy, put so many resources to building culture. 
But then, you know, one month later, two months later, three months later, the leaders stop living and bringing to life those values, those behaviors that they preach on every single day. So without a doubt, Kevin, uh, you know, it would be that the leaders have to have a relentless and obsessive focus on really having a self-observation every day. Am I living this culture? Am I truly bringing to life what we want this culture to be for this organization? Before we shift gears uh, to, and start to wrap this up, um, you've been working with organizations for a long time, as you said, uh, in this area. Uh, but three years ago, almost exactly three years ago, as it turns out, um, we had this thing called a virus, right? And a pandemic and a lockdown. So what have, what advice do you have if teams are, organizations are doing what you're describing, but they're doing it at a distance? Anything that you would say or add to our conversation if people are doing it at a distance? Yeah, I think that, you know, especially from, a, you know, I think right now, Kevin, you're also, and you're probably seeing a lot of this too in your work is, you know, I think you're seeing hybrid, you know, hybrid, you know, atmospheres and environments where, you know, maybe two days out of the week, you know, certain part of the organization's coming into the office and then everyone else's work from home, you know, but I think one of the biggest things, you know, is that not only does communication have to be up to par and kind of consistent and ongoing and almost fanatical when you're in the office, but when you have that hybrid environment, and even if you're doing it away at a distance, it even has to be more so. So as a leader, I think that consists of having those one-on-one -on -one meetings more frequently, both from a formal and informal perspective. Um, and then also as it relates to building culture, I mean, you have to really be tying culture and the culture that you want. You know, I think you use the terms aspirational culture, you know, talking about what success looks like from an organizational cultural perspective and, and everything that you do. You know, I know it sounds so, so much of common sense, but common sense isn't always common practice. And I think one of the very best things and I talk about it in the book is that the best football coaches, I mean, they're constantly saying the same things over and over and over and over again, just in different ways. You know, they're, they're finding different case studies. They're finding different stories. They're finding different poems. They're finding different things that they've maybe watched on film, you know, from a game. And they're integrating that into their team meetings. They're integrating that into their position meetings. They're constantly highlighting what excellence looks like and what it does not look like for their culture. And I think in, in the workplace, we as leaders can do the same thing, especially if we're doing it at a distance. Uh, the other thing I think that, you know, has to be done, um, you know, is even more so when you're doing it from afar is catching people do the right thing. You know, catching people do the right thing. I was just with a leader a couple months ago and, you know, they were having huge morale issues. They were having a very tough time to retain top talent. And one of the very first things I said, give me 30 days. Let me sit in on, you know, team meetings. Let me go to the sales operational sides. Let me go to the finance side. Let me just spend some time here on what's really going on. And at the very core of it, I mean, there were multiple operational and strategic issues going on, but at the very core of it, at the very core of it, the leaders in that organization did not feel the need to catch people to do the right thing because that was in their job title. That was in their job description. So they didn't feel that they had to go out of their way to tell Susie, Susie, you did a phenomenal job in that particular meeting with that client. This is why. But at the end of the day, when we're talking about building culture, I mean, you have to highlight what those wins look like. You have to highlight not only what those wins look like, but that brings enormous, immense amount of fulfillment to people's life. You know, when you're catching them do the right thing, and that sends a domino effect throughout the organization of what greatness, what excellence looks like, while you're also bringing deep fulfillment to people's lives by catching them do the right thing uh, and carry out your mission and build your culture. So, Kevin, those are a few things that I would share. I mean, obviously, there's way more, uh, you know, tactical and strategic things that we can get into, but those are some of the big things that I would keep an eye on. Changing direction. Uh, Matt, uh, when you're not writing and consulting and coaching and, and speaking, what do you do for fun? Oh, man, that's a great question. Um, you know, my wife would, if she was here right now, she would probably say nothing. <laughs> um, but, you know, the reason why I think she would say that is because I really, really deeply enjoy, uh, you know, just hanging out with my family, my friends. Um, you know, whether that's going out to dinner, I'm a big movie person, uh, even though I read a new book every single week. When I'm not on the road traveling, I travel over 200 plus days a year, uh, every year and have for the past really eight years. I just love to relax and kind of kick back. And whether I'm watching Netflix or watching a documentary, I uh, really just hang out with my family, my wife and my close friends. Speaking of reading, the only thing you knew I was going to ask you was this. And that's so what are you reading or what's something you read recently that people might be interested in? 
You know, so I'm actually, I just started it, so I can't give you my full, uh, you know, overview on kind of what I think of the book, but I just started a book called The Comfort Crisis. I think the author's name is Michael Easter. Uh, so there, there's been a couple leaders who told me about the impact and power of that book, uh, you know, as far as, you know, getting back to how discomfort is, you know, really beneficial for our lives, how it can add so much value and bring so much clarity to many things that we do from both a personal and professional perspective. So I've only finished the first two chapters, but so far I really like it. But uh, that's the book I'm reading right now. I did finish uh, Trust and Inspire uh, by Stephen Covey. Uh, recently. I, I believe that's his new book, the author of Speed of Trust. Um, so that was a book he released, I believe, last year. Uh, Trust and Inspire and the Comfort Crisis, both will be in the show notes. And so you can get those wherever you might want. But now the question you've been most wanting me to ask you, Matt, uh, where can we learn more about you? Where do you want to point people? I'll hold up the book for people that are watching. Culture is the way. How do you want to point? Where do you want to point people? How can they get connected with you? Where do you want to tell them? Yeah, so the, 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 the easiest and most efficient way is probably just my website at mattmayberryonline.com. Uh, I'm on all the social media channels. So LinkedIn, I'm very active on Twitter, uh, Instagram, and that's just Matt underscore Mayberry. So mattmayberryonline.com and then, you know, all the social media outlets, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and, and Instagram and so forth at Matt underscore Mayberry. And if you go to mattmaybearyonline.com, you can get more, get connected to go ahead and getting the copy of the book, or you can go to Amazon or anywhere you wish to get your copy of uh, Culture is the Way, How Leaders at Every Level Build an Organization for Speed, Impact, and Excellence. And now, before we go, the question that I ask all of you who are watching and listening every week, if you've been here before, you know the question. The question is this, now what? What action are you going to take as a result of this? Maybe uh, you realize that there are things that you can do, even if you're not a senior executive. And maybe what you were challenged with today was thinking about how are you role modeling the behaviors to help create the culture that you want. Maybe you are, were inspired to think about how do I share with others in my organization that we ought to be thinking about culture differently. I don't know what those things are for you, but what I do know is that if you don't take some action on what we've talked about today, you might have been better off watching Netflix. So the, the fact is that uh, we hope that today we inspired you and, and educated you and gave you new insights, but none of that matters if you don't take action. And I certainly hope that you do that. Uh, Matt, thanks so much for being here. It's a pleasure to have you. Thanks so much for having me, Kevin. I really appreciate it. And everybody, um, we'll be back next week with another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. If you liked it, um, go on, go, go to your platform and say that you did uh, give us a rating. We'd love that. And uh, tell your friends to come join us because we'll be back next week with another episode of the remarkable leadership podcast. Thanks everybody.